Good afternoon and welcome to the Art at Work webinar on selling your artwork. Um, my name is Kathy Tycholis. I am the Richmond Art Gallery's Education and Public Programs Coordinator. And um, I'll be your host for today and we'll be featuring our guest presenter, uh, Jeffrey Boone. Um, so first I would like to acknowledge that uh, we are working and living on the <clears throat> unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish uh, peoples of the first of the Coast Salish peoples, um, otherwise known as Vancouver. Um, and for those of you who are new to the program, um, Art at Work is a partnership between the Richmond Art Gallery, Richmond Public Art Program, and the City of Richmond Art Services. Uh, we do host these monthly sessions just in the spring, so this will be the final session for 2020. And um, we welcome you to join us again next year for more artist professional development workshops. Jeffrey Boone is a Vancouver-based art supporter who has worked with artists, collectors, dealers, and cultural level lovers with various projects, acquisitions, exhibitions, events, and tours. He collects art, has a background in cultural event management and art consulting. And Jeffrey operated his own art gallery, has been executive director of the Eastside Culture Crawl and programmer and chair for the Contemporary Art Society of Vancouver. So thank you very much for being here today, Jeffrey. And for now, I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks for inviting me, Kathy. Uh, and thanks everyone who's listening. I'm gonna try and share my screen. So, thanks. You wanna sell your art, good for you. First of all, I'm not really an expert in this. Uh, I, uh, I'm not a complete authority. As Kathy said, it is uh, completely general. I'm just going to lend you some thoughts uh, and what I've picked up in the 30 years that I've been visiting artist studios. It started when I was a student at uh, Memorial University in uh, Newfoundland where I was studying theater, but I spent all of my time in artist studios, uh, bugging them at what they were doing and why they were doing, probably wanting to be an artist, but not really having the skills or the drive to, to do it. Uh, so I first started collecting work then. Uh, for the past 10 years, I've been advising and consulting with artists on projects, uh, doing studio visits, helping people kind of get over hurdles in their work. Uh, which is part of something that I've done with the uh, Contemporary Art Society, organizing uh, studio visits. Um, I've also helped out advising nonprofit organizations on how to overcome problems to connect to their audience, to their supporters. As Kathy said, I did run my own commercial gallery, which I opened very naively, believing that that was the only problem that existed, was really just if you open a space, then people will come and buy the work. And after five years of doing that, I realized, well, it took more than that. So uh, I learned a lot. Uh, by doing that. And then I also ran the culture crawl where I spoke to hundreds of artists uh, for three years. So I learned a lot about what works for them. So I'm going to kind of share you some thoughts on those sorts of things. So I think this, this talk was uh, entitled How to Sell Your Art. I think that in order to know how, you really have to back up and do the, the big W5, the who, what, when, where, and why of your own practice. It's, it's a process. It, there is no one answer for anyone, but it does, take, it does take work. You have to really analyze what it is that you're doing, who you're selling to, when you're selling, what you're selling, and it does take some reflection. So I think probably the most important way to go about it is to start with why you want to sell your work and whether you actually do need to sell your work. Some people are in a position where they don't really need to make money from their art. It's a hobby, it's a passion that they have. Uh, and all they really want is the affirmation of having their work on someone's walls and having someone appreciate it. In which case, and I do know artists who have done this, they really just turn to keeping their day job and making work that they give away as, as gifts to friends uh, and family. And that's satisfying for them. They don't have the pressure to, they don't feel the pressure that they have to sell work. Most people, however, do feel that they need to generate some, some cash revenue. They have to buy art supplies. Um, they have to pay studio rent. They have to support their family. Um, so it's up to each individual person, I think, to sit down and really analyze why it is that you want to sell your work. And if you do, what is it? What is your goal? What do you actually need to make financially from your work? So then you have a hard goal. It is a, this, this is a business if you're selling your work and you have to look at it as a business. So you have to analyze what does your goal have to be? 
once you have decided on why it is and what your what your goal is, I have to go through these. Sorry, uh, <laughs> you have to look at what exactly it is that you do in in your work. You may have an idea. Uh, other people who look at your work may have other ideas. So you want to talk to your family and friends, people who do have your work, and spend some time. Do studio visits, have them over to your studio to talk about what it is you're doing so that you can develop what I'm calling a, a pitch, an elevator pitch in the business world. It should be a very super short, super simple, super clear statement about what it is that you do in, in your work. So as you start promoting yourself, you know what your goal is, you know exactly what your very simple statement is, and you can give people a kind of uh, a teaser, an overview statement, which is just clear enough so that they have an image and it leaves lots of space for them to ask you questions if, if they're interested. So someone like Bobby Burgers, who's super successful, could say that she does monolithic oil paintings of floral arrangements. And that is super simple and that's what she does and the conversation would go from there. Someone like Lynette Dombiaki would say that she does figurative oil paintings depicting fictional characters from her own short stories. Um, she's in a very happy position of letting them to do that, but uh, it's a place where the conversation could open. And Elaine Mary, who I think is listening, hello Elaine, could say that she does uh, ink on mylar self-portraits that are superimposed with plant life. Very simple and a conversation can go from there. And obviously it takes a long time to develop such a pithy statement once you know what your, what your work is about. And that's a, a process. Brendan Tang uh, could say that he does ceramic sculptures that hybridizes uh, futuristic technology and ancient traditions. So once you've gone through this process, you know why you want to sell your work, you have a sense of what the, your goal is, and you have a pithy statement, you know exactly what your work is, then you have to ask yourself, is it the right time? Are you, are you actually ready to sell your work? Are you able to consistently produce the work that you want to sell or the type of work that you want to sell? Um, will you have enough inventory to go out to, to start selling to people. Have enough good examples in your studio that you can start to bring people in to show them or to offer into exhibitions so that you can reliably provide that work when opportunities come up. And have you planned for all the technical things? Are you able to make a transaction? I know this is really super boring, but it's busy, but it's the business of it. Uh, how are you going to take payment for it? How are you going to pack the work? How are you going to ship the work? Or are you going to deliver it? Does it require being installed? Does the work need to be cared for in any particular way? Does it have any technical requirements or any sort of climate considerations? Are you prepared to offer that help to your your clients and the people who will live with your work. Really super boring, the business of selling art. And the next thing, oh, that slide is terrible. Look, it's all off. Oh, I'll have to fix that later. But you have to know who you're selling to and who is really two different sorts of strains. One is the actual individuals. Who are the people that you're gonna start talking to about it? And then what is their character? Well, so we'll look at this in two different ways. The first one is your network. It's the people in your life that are going to be your first market if you're just starting out, and some of you may already be. Have the people around you who support you, so bear with me for a minute on that. But you're really just going to, once you know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how much you have to do, you're going to start asking your friends and family to support you. Tell them that you're launching your career, that you, you want to sell work, and you have work to sell, and you're going to show them the work, bring it to them. We'll talk about those sort of uh, opportunities later, but for now, you're actually just gonna ask people to, to support you. And you're armed with all the information that you need about the, the work. And then you're gonna engage in the conversation of how, how they can support and whether they will or not. Some people will say yes, some people will say no, some people will say yes and they actually won't, some people will say no, but eventually they might. Don't be discouraged and just keep doing it. It's business, you have to keep doing what they call prospecting. Yeah, it's super boring, but it's what you have to do. Once you've 
made your way through your friends and family, the people who are close to you that you're probably most comfortable talking to, then you kind of have to start to reach out to the next level of people. Acquaintances or um, maybe colleagues at your day job, possibly even your doctor if you had a good relationship with them, your dentist, your car mechanic, people in clubs that you're uh, a member of, just continuously reaching out to people with your very good statement about what you do, that you're an artist, that you're looking to sell your work. Are you interested? Would you like to come see it? I have an exhibition wherever. You have to just keep selling it in that way, that very first initial reaching out to people. It's not, it's not even the marketing part. It's really just starting to build a network and it's relentless and grueling and it goes on probably for your entire life until you have a gallery who's going to do it for you. Uh, if you decide to have a gallery, which you may not. Then the other part, which is really super technical, but uh, it's something that you have to understand. I think it's one of the big things that I didn't really understand when I ran a gallery. I really thought anyone who comes in is interested in art and you just have to sort of help them buy it. It's a lot, it's a lot more nuanced than that. There are what uh, I've realized uh, the importance of when I studied business, I uh, did a business course at BCIT years ago and uh, buyer personas were one of the things that they had talked about. And it's basically a theory. There's a lot of resources online that you can, that you can research different theories. Some say that there are five personality types, others say that there are 10. I've chosen one uh, RAIN marketing uh, website that breaks it down into, I think, five or six types. And it's basically how you approach those sorts of personality types. One of them is a decision maker, someone who comes along, they're very uh, authoritative and they're very confident in what they're doing. They might be very challenging to you. They may ask very uh, demanding and pushy questions that you may feel uh, you may feel quite a lot of pressure, but it's just a sort of their, their style. You have to speak to those people in the same sort of way. You've done your research on what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and you come back and answer the questions with the same sort of authority. You may challenge them as well, and you engage in a sort of very hard conversation. They feel like it's an equal, and if they like your work, then they buy it. And this is not a science, it's just you have to be aware that sometimes that's how people do, that's how some people go through a buying process. Other people are what are called collaborators. They will want to sort of feel like they're working with you on solving this problem. So you want to make solving the problem of buying the artwork. So you want to work with them as well. And you let them take the lead on, the, on what the conversation should be. So you are giving them your pitch about your work, you ask them their thoughts on it and let them sort of direct where the conversation is going to go. If they have ideas about your work, be in total agreement and just, just go with them. The relators are the people who I find probably the easiest to deal with uh, in, in art. The people who want to have relationships with you as the artist. They want to know about you and what you're doing. They want to hear personal stories. They want to kind of build a relationship with you and that will help them in, enjoy your work. They may not even want to talk about the work itself. They may not want to talk about the price. They may not want to talk about any of the details. They want to feel like they have a good relationship with you. And then they will well, presumably feel, feel better about buying your work and supporting what it is that you're doing. Then there's the analyzers who are very technical people. They, I can't even imagine what they would be asking you, but it's about you know, the materials that you're using, the time, the process, if there's technology, they want to know the details, how the work is delivered, what sort of platform it exists on, and you really just have to be prepared to give those people all of the technical details that, that they want. Don't worry about helping them understand the theory or the background. You don't necessarily have to build a good relationship with them. You don't have to appeal to their ego. They really are just inter interested in, in the, the, the details, the, te the technical. And again, just follow that if you get a sense of that's the, what sort of person they are. 
And then there are something that this organization calls the innovators, the people who may have ideas about your work that you hadn't considered. They might have uh, new ideas about how you can install the work or what you can do with do in the work to make the, something for them that they like. And again, you have to sort of follow what they want in as much as you, you possibly can. And they'll present you with things that you hadn't really considered, which uh, as an artist, you may not be quite so happy about, but if you want to make the sale, then you have to just sort of think as a business person that you're delivering this product and they have this idea about how it should be done, then you engage in that conversation about how you're going to do it. Um, I, I have to tell you a little story about a piece of work that I bought where uh, I was, I, I think I was going at this piece in a kind of uh, innovator sort of way. The artist had done a series of four photographs where he had sent a package including a camera and some instructions to four people around the globe with instructions to take two sticks to make a point on a ground on a very specific um, uh, uh, point in the longitude and latitude on the globe. When he got these four photographs back, when they're installed, it essentially makes a square that at one point in time was a square within the globe, if you can picture that. And I thought the work was very interesting. The photographs didn't really matter, but the work was interesting. So I asked if he would just send me the file for the photographs and let me print my own. But what I wanted to buy was the kit that he had sent to, to uh, all these four people around the world. So I thought that's the most interesting piece of work. And uh, he kind of liked the second part of the idea. So he said, I'll make you a deal. You buy the photographs and I'll give you the box anyway. Uh, and we made the deal happen. I think you kind of have to do that. Sometimes people will ask you to do something that's essentially what you do, but slightly off. And you have to decide whether you're willing to do it. And if you want to make the sale, then I guess you have to have to be willing to do it. In terms of where, uh, there are two different ideas about where. There's the physical sort of locations, and I'll talk about that later. The first one is the easiest at this point in time, and particularly under the current pandemic situation, which we'll or they expect to go on for whatever, a year or, or two. It's sort of going to be the new normal, as we're all saying. So, you know, that, that's online. And you really do have to have a solid presence there and use it in a really effective, uh, effective way. And you have to be smart about it. Again, it's just the business of it. You might be comfortable with it. You might not be comfortable with it, but you do kind of need it at this point in time. The biggest one that the biggest online presence that is the easiest and probably the most powerful is Instagram. Excuse me. The reason I like it so much is because it is completely visual. You have the grid or the scroll where it is only the images. And that is presumably what your work is about. There is a visual element to it. It's not a particularly crowded space with other sorts of information. Uh, and many of you will be totally au fait with how to use Instagram, but many people might not be. You just have to bite the bullet and do the research and start Googling how to use Instagram most effectively, what constitutes uh, a, a good account. And most importantly, at whatever level you are, you have to keep it active. You have to be posting uh, frequently, possibly daily. And you can be doing your finished work. You can be doing work in progress. You can be showing things that are inspiring to you. You, you shouldn't be showing the babies and the dogs and the and the, the cats and the and the food. Not too much of that on your professional, but some of it maybe to keep it personal. What you really should be doing is showing your work where it's installed with the people who buy it, so that they can see you producing the work. They can see the work that's available or the work that has been sold, and most importantly, they see it out there in someone's home in someone's office, because you're sending the message to them that. Your work does sell, people do live it, here's how, how it, people do live with it, here's how it looks in, uh, you know, a, a dining room situation, here it looks in the living room. You're kind of helping people know that your work does have a, does have a market. People want to buy what other people have. Facebook 
is a good commitment. You need all of these things together. To some degree, you'll pick your own combinations of it, but I think the two ba very basic ones are Instagram and Facebook, which are all owned by Facebook. So that makes it easy to do a post on Instagram that will then be automatically posted onto Facebook. I think Facebook is good because you can create a bit of a space that's just about you and your work. So you can have uh, images about a series that you're doing. You can also post a, a, a video in there. You can have a longer text. You can have more detail about the particular work that you're showing. And then you can also do events. You can invite people to events in the real world where they can sign up and you can also do uh, live broadcasts on both of these platforms to which you can invite people to. Uh, so they book in, in advance. It's taking advantage of those tools to be your own gallery essentially in some way, doing what you don't have a gallery to do for you. Uh, the next one that is pretty basic but a bit more advanced is having your own website. If you're not able to do it yourself, then find some way, if you can, uh, to have someone build you one, which can be done on uh, WordPress. I believe it's still for free. And that is a space that is 100% about your work. You can have a lot more detail. You can update it once or twice a year. It doesn't need to be like Instagram or Facebook, which is much more active. It's the solid place that someone can go to to have a more concentrated look at what you're doing. Uh, Instagram and Facebook, obviously there's a lot, there's lots of other people in those virtual spaces when they're looking at your work. If someone is interested enough to find out more about you, then you really do need to have a website to, to, back, to back that up. Uh, Twitter is something that uh, I personally really don't like. It's not very visual. It's super busy. There's so many hashtags and uh, many links to other things and each little tweet seems to be in a massive big web. But a lot of people do love it, obviously. There are people who don't do Instagram, people I know in the art world who don't do Instagram, they do Twitter. Those little tweets of 240 characters are super rich and you can link to so many different things. So you can place yourself in that web. It, it, there are people who love it, I personally don't use it because it's not as visual and you can't really grab someone's attention and get them to look in detail at things. But if you're interested in having and being a part of a very dynamic, dynamic conversation, then you should probably add that in there. Once you have those sorts of, let's call them the marketing parts of an online presence, you need to have a space where you can actually sell your work, where it, it, it's an actual marketplace. Uh, Etsy, many people have used it. It's huge, apparently. Lots of people sell, sell work through it. It, it, is, it is a marketplace. Uh, I understand from, from some people that it's a very good starter when your prices are very low, but there, there's a kind of cap. People don't buy work above a certain price um, through, through Etsy, but you do need to have some sort of a marketplace. Uh, Facebook also has a marketplace. I don't know if the cap is, is as low or for the, the price that things tend to sell on, um, uh, sorry, to tend to sell on Etsy. I think maybe Facebook has a broader one, but you do need to have a space to sell things through. Uh, Saatchi Art is another huge uh, website uh, based in, in Britain and associated with the Saatchi Art Gallery. And it is huge internationally. There are thousands of artists on it. It's a very good looking website. Um, the really good thing about it, even though it's super crowded, is that I do know the curators at Saatchi Gallery have gone through Saatchi Art, the marketplace website, and found artists whose work they particularly like to include in the exhibitions that they have in the gift shop at the gallery. Uh, they do take uh, a, a cut. Obviously, all of these platforms, uh, I, I believe it's free to list, but then there's a charge uh, with every transaction. So you are paying a commission to them for being there. Uh, and that's the case with, uh, with everyone. So you have to, I think, really assess that and see if it's worth it to you. Um, Sachi's good in, the, in that way because it is 
so big, but there is the slight, the very, very tiny possibility that one of their curators will, will see your work. That does have a huge uh, international reach. Uh, Art Finder is another less well-known one, but is, is uh, just a marketplace. Uh, the format is, uh, is very clean and very focused and straightforward. It's very easy for people to search by, by media or price point or country. They're also based in Britain, but they, um, they do have a, a large international reach. The new thing that's happening, which is super exciting these days, uh, is the virtual reality 3D online presence. Uh, if you want to see how that works, I did do a 3D uh, photograph of the exhibition that uh, Marion Scott Gallery has on right now of Hazel Wilson's um, uh, ceremonial robes. And essentially, it is a, a, a piece of technology that takes a series of 360 degree photographs that when viewed on a website, you can click through and go on a walk uh, and sort of rotate around to look at um, to look as if you are in the space. And if you have a, a VR headset, then you actually are immersed in, in these spaces. I think under this current lockdown situation, more and more galleries at least are starting to look at how they can do this. How's Your Own Worth has, uh, is in the process right now of launching a, a completely virtual gallery in, uh, in uh, conjunction to their various spaces around the world. Um, that it is is just going to be a separate gallery in in uh, in virtual reality. It's a bigger consideration, but if you don't have a gallery and you don't have the opportunity to have exhibition uh, have uh, an exhibition in a physical space, then and you you're able to have someone photograph your studio uh, or some other space where you can install your work, then you can insta uh, post those photographs on Facebook and uh, various other websites. If you want to pay a membership, there's something called Matterport, where you, can, uh, where you can post those images so that people can do a studio visit with you virtually wherever they are in the world. It's a bigger consideration, but uh, it's something that I think you're going to see more of in the future. It's another way for people to access your work. So that's virtually. Then there's the real world, the physical world of where you're going to sell your work. And if you've gone through your process and done the why you're making work, what you're making, and you feel that you're ready to sell it, you are going to be selling it everywhere you go. You it's a part of your, your networking, your outreach continuously, you're constantly selling your work. Not that you're just walking up to strangers and asking me to want to buy your work, but every time you meet someone, you have to be assessing, is this someone who could be interested in buying your work and seeing if you can engage the conversation with them, figure out how, if they, do buy work, what it is that they buy, asking what kind of work they have already. It, you always have to be prepared to engage in the selling. But the biggest and most important venue that you have is your studio. And whatever that is, it might be your kitchen table that you clear away at night. It could be a space that you rent somewhere or a space that you share. It could be a, a, a garage or in your basement. You have some physical space where you make the work presumably. And I really do believe that that is, that's the, the best tool you're ever gonna have to sell work. Everyone who loves art loves to do a studio visit. It, the place is magical. It's where you have all the things that you're working on. It's all where you have all the things that influence you. You have postcards and other people's artwork and images and objects and colors that are a part of what it is that you do and the ideas that you have. All of those things creep into your work. So allowing people to come into your space to see that and to talk about your work and how it connects to those things is the number one most, the number one biggest treat that any art lover can have is the studio visit. And you have to know how to do it effectively. So I'll talk more about that later, but that's the number one place. If you can get an exhibition somewhere other than your studio, and you can set your, set your studio up as an exhibition space, which is what uh, many of the really smart people who are in the culture crawl do, uh, they clear away their space for that one weekend and they make it into an exhibition space. If you're able to do that, that would be ideal. There are opportunities 
without having a commercial gallery where you can uh, at least apply for an exhibition at community galleries. There's various other sorts of open calls for submissions in different spaces. And I think that whatever your aspirations are, you should be applying for these things relentlessly. Every opportunity that comes up, just keep applying. If nothing else, then the people who are on those committees or those assessments are seeing your work. So you're presenting yourself in a professional way in as much as you possibly can. It may pay off, it may not pay, pay off. Everyone has a different saturation point for how much they can tolerate of doing that sort of work, but you really should be doing it. Uh, charity auctions is a big, it, well, it's a controversial topic these days. It is a good way to get your work out in front of people who do buy art. And I would highly recommend that you consider donating work to it, but you have to ask questions when you do. Firstly, you should be asking if they do accept your work or if they ask you to submit work, are you getting a cut? Is there some kind of a split between the charity and the artist? I think that Carfac recommends that it should be a 50-50 split. Some uh, galleries, because of the uh, uh, nonprofits who run charity art auctions, uh, it's not really feasible to make a 50-50 split, so they will sometimes offer less. You have to decide what your comfort, com comfort level is with uh, how much you need to get back if you're going to let them uh, sell your work. You also want to ask in helping make that decision whether or not you get a ticket to the event and if they will tell you or connect you to the person who ultimately buys the work because that person presumably could be a client in the future. And you want to ask if they publish a catalog. And of course, you also want to know if your work is going to be in the live portion or a silent portion of the auction. Obviously, the live portion is, is much better. Um, there is a huge controversy uh, as to who, who supports these charity auctions. So do your research, figure out what your comfort level is. I think it's, if you're starting out, it's a really important way to get your work in front of a lot of people who compete to buy art. It will also help you determine very early in your career what your market value is. If there's lots of competition, you've donated a piece, then for the next year or so, that's your standard. That is where what has set a new price for you. Con the converse can also be true as well. If it sells for less than your, 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 what you normally sell your work for, or what you need to sell your work for, it's not really gonna help you. So go into it having done your research. Uh, there's something which I don't really know if we have a lot of here in Vancouver, maybe there's people in other places, but they're, uh, they're vanity galleries or essentially galleries that you can rent space. I think they're a great opportunity. They're also controversial, but you have to do your research going into it. It's essentially, uh, it's a business that operates by renting the space to uh, an artist or a group of artists for a, a period of time. It could be a one night event, it could be a weekend event, a whole week or an entire month. And it does cost money to rent the space. Obviously they are a business, so they have uh, fees associated with what they offer you. They could also uh, be promoting uh, the event to their list, they may charge you extra for that. Uh, I think it's a really good opportunity. If you can find a space and you can afford to rent it for yourself to do it, if you're not getting an exhibition anywhere else, it is a really good way once you have made a bit of a network to do a show if you don't think that your studio space is going to suffice, then renting a space. You may also want to look into uh, be a bit creative about other spaces that are empty if you have contacts through your family and friends who know of empty retail space. This is a uh, probably a more expensive endeavor because you'll need insurance and you'll need to be quite organized about it. Uh, if you can temporarily rent a retail space that is sitting empty. It's, it's, a, it's a long shot, but it's worth it if you feel that you really need to have an exhibition where people can come see your work. And again, you can't do it in your studio. Um, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of real estate stagers, the people who take your place when you're gonna sell it and they kind of decorate it to make it look market ready. If you have a connection to these people, people who work in that or real estate agents, it is worth asking if 
they can use your work to install in their spaces. Um, it obviously puts it in a domestic context, people viewing the home or the, the real estate agents have the place photographed with your art in it. It is extra advertising. It may or may not sell, but it is a place for you to get your work into a situation in front of people. Uh, sometimes these staging companies buy work. It is worth approaching them. I do know of this one artist who uh, wasn't really doing uh, quite so well with selling his own art artwork, so he became a stager. Uh, that he would work for a staging company. And then he eventually started to install his own work in these uh, uh, units and houses that he was staging and his work was selling. And it got to the point where he stopped doing the staging and all he was doing was just supplying his work to other stagers. And this is how he sells his work from his studio and to, uh, to, to realtors and people who are buying homes. And he's, uh, I believe now making his living his whole career is selling work through being a stager. It's not gonna work for everyone, but it's a clever idea to find uh, a market. Retail shops, cafes, those sorts of things. Uh, these opportunities come up, obviously not under this time. <laughs> this, uh, I think people are taking the decoration off their walls in cafes right now. Uh, these opportunities come up, I really don't know how good they are. They seem really tempting because there's a lot of traffic. I don't know if things sell so well. Uh, there are, however, furniture shops or decor shops, depending on what your work is like, it doesn't necessarily fit for everyone, but it is wise, I would think, if your work does lend itself to being in a decorator sphere, is to kind of reach out to people you know who are connected to retail to see if they would uh, represent your work or if, and this is a big jump that really only works for people with a certain type of work or a certain type of career, if you're able to translate your work into products. Some artists uh, are really not inclined to do that. Other people have made a huge and very successful career of putting images of their work onto everything from tea towels to postcards to greeting cards, fridge magnets, everything. Uh, I'm sure many of you, if you live in Vancouver, know Hilary Morris, who runs her shop on Granville Island. Um, she, I talked to her years ago uh, about her, her business is super, super successful. And she said that after art school, she knew that she wanted to paint in this very particular style. She didn't want to be a starving artist. So she started doing those things, tea towels, mugs, cups, greeting cards, anything she possibly could. And she's hugely, hugely successful and very happy. Uh, there are other artists who have two sort of separate product lines. They make their art and then they have their product which they sell in online shops or through retail shops and they're completely separate. It's the same sort of imagery but they're targeting two completely different things and sometimes they don't even put links on their own website. They don't want their art career mixed with their retail career. It's not necessary for everyone but if you think it could work for you, then it's a way of getting things, things out there. Another good way of reaching out to new markets is to take residencies, which is again, not necessarily for everyone, but they're a really great opportunity if you can get into one. Obviously not under these circumstances that we're in now because no one's traveling, but if you can get into a residency in another city or another province or another country for however long, uh, it's a good chance for you as an artist to make work, but also it puts you in a whole new network of, of people. It also provides you something to talk about to your current network through your social media or you know, newsletter, whatever you're doing. Uh, but the, the main thing is that it gets you into a, a possible new, new market. It's not for everyone, there are very few of them, but it's really worth looking into. And then your studio. Again, it is the single most important place where you're ever going to sell work. And you do want to think about how you're going to run a, a studio visit, uh, which I think that you, if really good people will set up one day during the week or a weekend during the month where they're only doing studio visits. They're not doing work during that week. They don't take 
request for studio visits at other times, that is the weekend or the day or whatever where they're completely set up for it, where you completely clear your space out. Uh, it may look like the before, you want it to look something like the after, depending on the nature of your work. Um, and you want, to, you want to be prepared for this. When you're inviting people in, you will give people a time period. You don't want people to just sit around and chat all day. You don't want them to pop in for five minutes. Plan to keep people's attention for, you know, maybe a half hour, maybe 45 minutes. You know what you're going to show them. You're going to have work that's in progress. If there's source material that you use, those things are available. You're going to have some finished work that relates to what you're working on now. You want to have some old work so you can show people samples of what you've done previously. You're going to have some refreshments for people, a place where they put down their bag and their coat where they're not going to get paint on it. Uh, you want to really think about hosting people and you want to have some materials that they can take away. If you have that sort of thing, some printed matter, your CV, postcards, whatever, you sort of have something to stay with them. You also want to have a plan to follow up with people, to thank them for their time, to continue a conversation that you had started with them during the studio visit. They've, they're interested enough to come and take a look. You want to keep the relationship with them. The most important thing, as you can see in, in uh, Amy Sackstetter's studio redo, was this wall space right here. She has something hung up on it now, something that she's currently working on. But I really highly advise you to have a space in your studio that's a good clean wall with not too much around it. Or if it's sculpture, a space like the table below the uh, below that wall, where you can put work where it's uncluttered and people can just sort of focus on that one thing that they're interested in. I have actually seen people make successful sales just by taking work and relocating it to the wall when there's nothing around. People seem interested, they, they, they're probably thinking about decorating or they have a specific place where they want this work to go. And then you just sort of move it over to the very clean place and let them enjoy it, let them imagine it in their, in their own space. So you're thinking ahead about featuring things. This is a sort of wall where you're gonna feature things or uh, the surface. Uh, and you can kind of rotate through the things that you're selling or the old work. It's not a, a space where you're going to show what you're working on right now. Keep that sort of separate. This is the, 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 the wall where you're going to make the sales. So when you're doing a studio visit, these are the things. You've done your, your why you're making work. You know what it is that you're making. You're ready to sell. You know who you're selling to. The people who are coming into your studio, you've thought about or you're going to try and determine what kind of uh, person they are. Do they want to know the technical details? Do they just want to build a relationship with you? Are they going to be analytical? You're going to have be prepared for those, so all those different sorts of conversations. You have an online presence to back up what you're doing. You've done your networking. The studio is prepared. You've got your presentation ready. You know how you're going to fill the half hour of time that you're talking to people. You've got the works in progress. You've got the feature space. You've got something uh, to, for them to take away and your follow-up plan. Here's a, a trick that someone once told me who works in the business, and I have noticed that other people do it as well. You want to show people that your work sells. Uh, you're going to talk about people who have your work already, not in specifics, but you're gonna talk about situations where your work has gone, the sorts of people that do buy your work or where your work looks good, what kind of collections it's in, if it's in collections, or what kind of furniture it matches, if it matches furniture. And people also wanna see work sell physically. They wanna see as some evidence that the work sells. So you're gonna have some photographs of the situation that things are in. And the trick that someone told me was to have, and, and they do this because I've seen them do it, they always have work that's wrapped and labeled for pickup or for shipping, identified just enough that people know, oh, that's a real person who's buying that work. It's sitting in the corner when they come in with bubble wrap, it's at the front of the gallery, or if it's an art fair, it's packed and it's at the front of their booth. It's, you're just sending this subliminal message that people do buy your work. And people, you know, success begets success, so people want to see that other people want to have the work as well. It's a little bit of a subliminal trick, nothing that you're going to point out. Um, uh, and, uh, sorry, yes. 
the feature wall is the how you're going to show the work at its best, um, which is why you want to take the finished things and show them there as opposed to the things that are in, in progress. You want to leave that in the sort of working sphere. When you're handling work, do treat it like it's a luxury item. Presumably you're asking a particular price for it. You want to treat it carefully and treat it like it is already valued. Regardless of what the personality type is of the, or what you assume this buyer persona is, you want to sort of draw out the conversation from them, asking about them, their interests, their hobbies, their work, to get some conversation going about them. You also want to be asking about the kind of work that they already have, if they collect or what, if they do studio visits, who, who, who other artists they know. You want to get a sense of what it is that they like and see how they talk about, the, talk about the work that they do have or what they like. And then obviously they're going to, that is going to be telling you how you need to be talking about, uh, talking about your work, if there is the right sort of connection. What you're trying to do is determine what gets them to buy work. And this again, it, it's just the business. You're not talking about your own work in the situation. What you're trying to do is figure out how that person likes to buy. You're eliciting information basically, and that's just through asking about them. And whatever it is that they see in your work that they like, just, you just have to agree with it. Don't point out the thing, I've made this mistake many times. You point out the thing that you think is most interesting or good about your work. That's great, but the thing that's going to make them buy is what they find interesting in it. So if they think that the most important part of it is that flashing light that you've attached to the side, then that is the most important thing for them. Just go with it. You want to help them get to yes and take the work. If you want to draw people in to a particular piece that they have expressed interest in, point out specific details about it. Give them tiny bits of information about the technique, not that you're going to uh, overload them with too much information, but let them feel that they are getting into the inner circle of the, the life of that one particular thing. It helps them feel closer to it. If anyone has any sort of a, an issue in regard to what the buying personality is, you want to help them solve the problem, whether it's the the size of the piece, the placement, you're helping them get to yes, offer solutions to any problem that they have. Many people will say that they really don't have space for work. That's the, probably the easiest excuse that any collector or buyer will make. Uh, if you can help them think about how they could move things around at home, then you're solving that problem, just as an example. Oops. Uh, and oh, what's going on here? I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, the, the kind of cincher seems to be if you can help people imagine where the, the piece of work is going to go. And it's a very basic sort of question. And you want to in, get them to kind of go down that road. If they tell you that they do, then ask where it is. Ask what else is around that. Ask what other artwork is in that room, how your work might be in dialogue with that other work and how it will fit. It's basically them getting them to explain to you how they're going to live with it, which essentially is them convincing themselves how they're going to live with it. So you've done all of these various things. So there's one particular artist uh, who I think really exemplifies how to run a business. Um, so to kind of draw together everything I've been telling you about, it's Lisa Okowitz, who was on the board of the Culture Crawl when uh, I started uh, working with them. I don't think she's on the board with them now. Um, she, this is, well, over 10 years ago. So she had been, uh, you know, just starting her career. She had been painting for five years. She had a day job. And at that point, she was starting to think about how she could uh, sort of, you know, make a living as an artist. She was really super smart. She had a, a shared studio space. Uh, as more space became available, she would rent the space and then sublet to other people so that she eventually uh, is renting the entire unit. So it's, her rent is obviously going down in that process. It gave her the opportunity to take the best space in the in the studio 
and she would do many of the things that I've told you about. She will clear out her studio to make exhibitions. You can see her space. This is her working studio, which is tiny. It's probably only about 10 feet by 10 feet or 12 feet by 12 feet. And she's been working in there for, well, more than a decade now. And she will clean out regularly to feature her work, to do small exhibitions. She's also very regimented about how she runs a studio visit. She uh, sends out newsletters regularly that to all of the people who bought her work, people who have signed up to do, other artists who have signed up to do tutorials with her. She keeps uh, a very good list of uh, people to market to. Uh, not that she's constantly selling to them, but once or twice a year, you get an email from Lisa where there's a very personal story about something that she's doing, a resident that she's worked on, a particularly meaningful sale to her, or an opportunity that's come up. She has run into the problem. You can see that her painting, this sort of size that you see there, is kind of a, the size that she likes to work on. Sometimes it's much larger. Not everyone has space for that. So she's found a way to do that work on a, a much smaller scale. It's not her main thing, but for the people who say it's too big, she can say, well, here, there's this. It's similar. It's from the same series. It's the same palette. It's all the same ideas in it, and it's much smaller and more affordable. It's not her main thing, it's not what she forwards, but it, it does make up a part of her, um, her, her revenue. She is also very strategic about reassessing what she does. She will try something, she'll try it in the best way she possibly can, and then she'll assess what has, wor what has worked and what hasn't. Um, she d has done residencies, uh, not huge residencies attached to collectors of collections, but she'll take advantage of any opportunity that she can to go live somewhere else for uh, a few weeks to make work. And it does provide uh, something for her to write about in these newsletters to her, her clients to share more of what's going on. Um, she also, as I said, she volunteers. She's on the, the, uh, the board of the Culture Crawl. She was uh, she would donate work to auctions. It, she thinks about it in a, in a very global way, how she can run her business. And it has got to the point now where she, I think for several years, she has, doesn't have a day job. She is supporting herself uh, entirely from her art, doing whatever it is within her art to make it work. Uh, it's worth following her on Instagram or signing up for her newsletters to see what she's doing. I did ask her if I could say this about her, so she's uh, quite okay with it. But I think she has really, she sort of uh, defines a lot of the best practices for how to, how to sell your work, how to build your career as an artist. She doesn't have a gallery that represents her. I don't think she ever has. But she does sell her work through the uh, Art Rentals and Sales program. So it's not a, an actual sort of commercial gallery representing her, but um, it is another part of her revenue where they, they she gets, uh, I think, a portion of the rental fee from the gallery and sometimes the work does sell, does sell. So it's really a sort of, she's looked at the whole thing from a, a global perspective, how she can, how she can reach new markets in, uh, uh, across many different ways. And it's, it's for her, it, she built a successful business of her art and she keeps the two divided. There's business and there's the, uh, and then there's the, the art. So I think she sums up my best advice for, for you for how to sell your work. And it is, it is work, it is a business. I do have one question coming in. Okay. <laughs> Um, from Lorraine, uh, branding. Can you explain more about branding? Hmm. I'm not really an expert in that, but you know it's good when when it uh, when it does work. Um, I, I am aware of when it's really good in Instagram. If I can speak to that, because uh, I do think it is important that you're consistent in terms of what it is that you post, the images that you post, and not that you should use filters, but if you are framing all of your posts in a similar sort of way, then it's consistent. And you're constantly sending the message about what it is your, your work is. Lisa is, if I can use her example, is very good at branding. As you can see, she's got this sign on the, 
uh, above with her, her name, which is her, her, her logo. I'm not sure if she designed the font or the typeface or not. She very well may have. Um, I think as you get established, it's, it's probably a good idea to do it. I don't think it's necessarily that, that huge a deal. Uh, I don't really think you have to spend too much time thinking about the, the branding of your marketing material. Your main thing is really just to, to start reaching out to people in whatever way you possibly can and see what sticks. I guess the things that do stick and the things that do seem to be successful, that becomes what your brand is. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, what percentage of time should one dedicate to selling versus making art? Oh, good question. Hmm. I don't know if I can say what a percentage is, but you wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you want to be spending too much time thinking about selling. Just set aside the time. You need to be in, your main reason being an artist is to make the work. So that needs to be your main thing. But I do know the people who have been successful, they do set aside a certain amount of time that there's one day per week when they do their office work, their desk work. And I do know some artists who clear away the space, like no, Saturdays is when I do business. Then there is no painting that it's just that one day per week when they're following up on emails, reposting their website, uh, shipping work. Uh, it's all things that happen in front of the the computer, I guess, on that side of the room, not at the painting, but I would say not too much. It's not that much fun, but you do have to have a dedicated amount of time. I guess it, it varies for different people. Um, a question from Tanis. Uh, wondering if you could talk more about 3D online presence and the technology to do it. I don't know if you have maybe just some links we can share or... Oh. Uh, yes, I'll put some, I'll put together a PDF with some links uh, that I'll send to you, Kathy, that you can share with people after. Um, I'm not really familiar with Insta, uh, with, sorry, with Facebook's uh, 3D photo technology, but I think that might be tied to newer model iPhones. But there are particular 3D cameras, which are essentially two fisheye lenses on either side of the, uh, this small device. Um, they're not, they're not cheap. I think there's probably about three or $400 for the lowest end and they go all the way up to thousands. There are people who do offer the service to do it. Um, you could kind of have a, a look around for that. Um, it, it, it's not really that technical. It's becoming really user friendly. If you have, uh, I think a newer model iPhone, then you can use this company called Matterport. And I'll give you a link to that where you can just use your iPhone to take multiple photographs and somehow that technology will stitch it together very easily. I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to these things, but it, it does just do it, it stitches together. Then you have to have a place to link it. I think it's a really great, it might be a bit of a, 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 a gimmick at the moment, but it's a really useful gimmick because if people aren't able to travel or they're sticking to their bubble, then it's a way for someone who's interested in doing a studio visit with you for you to kind of send them a link to the space that's installed. And then if you're doing a video chat with them, then they can be looking at this 3D photograph spinning around and zooming in on the details that they find interesting. It's a, uh, I'm sure there's a bit of a learning curve in how to use these things, but it is going to become more and more prominent. And also the VR headsets that are, you know, for gaming, there is, um, uh, as I said, more and more galleries are taking up online spaces. Oh, and I did forget to tell you about um, ArtGate. I'll put the link uh, on that PDF. They're a Canadian uh, virtual gallery based, I think, in Toronto, where for as little as uh, $10 per month, you can have a, your own 1,000 foot square uh, gallery space where you can upload, oh, I think it might be like 20 or more images. And it's just basically, it's just a 2D image, it's a JPEG file that you upload uh, that gets installed in a, a very uh, uh, formulaic way within their gallery space. And those gallery spaces can be hosted on or viewed, sorry, on Facebook, uh, possibly through other websites as well, but you don't need any special gear to, get your work up there or to view the work. 
uh, and it can be as cheap as ten ten dollars uh, per per month for one of these memberships. Matter uh, no, not matter board, sorry, uh, Art Cave. Great, and for everybody, um, we will be sending. I'll be emailing out in PDF with some of the links Jeffrey's mentioned, which relates to another question. If someone Tommy is asking, what are some channels to find open calls? Uh, the Alliance for Arts and Culture in Vancouver is very good. Uh, uh, I don't really know anywhere other than that. Uh, I do know that the city of Vancouver does send out notices uh, for open calls. So I think if you get listed with them, uh, there is also, uh, I mean, the other cities do it as well. Uh, I think all of the artist run centers will send out emails as it when when they have open calls it's good to get on those lists uh for vancouver or i think if you're in toronto or various other canadian cities there's instant coffee which is a, a list serve uh, if there are open calls they will often kind of list things there get on that and i think that's about uh, about it off the top of my head but your best source for those of that, that sort of information is each other is other artists uh you know, it's a shame that not everyone who's sitting around here uh, on this feed right now can't offer their best advice because I think you probably know all that more than I do. And I'll just make a little plug for the Richmond Art Gallery. Um, I run the Richmond Art Gallery Artist Salon Facebook group, okay. and that's all I use it for is for posting open calls, um, you know, or calls for commissions, that sort of thing. So oh, you can follow us there. Um, the link is on the Richmond Art Gallery website. Um, and actually, at one of our previous uh, salons, we had a huge list of just this. So I believe it's still on the Facebook group, just a huge list of all the different websites you can go to for just for calls for artists. Um, another question. Um, if I focus on portrait painting, is that something that people are interested in buying? Uh, sometimes, not everyone. Uh, I do know of uh, artists who have uh, been very smart about this. It, it's kind of at the lower end of the scale. It's not selling uh, you know, a very serious, large, major work. Uh, it's uh, smaller paintings at a very modest price that would be given as gifts. It depends on how much time you're willing to put into something that's going to sell for a, sm a lower amount of work. Um, some people have made very, very successful careers who are incredibly good painters to, and they're known for doing excellent uh, portraits. So I guess it's kind of really your skill level. If you are super excellent and you can do really uh, photorealistic images, then it could be worth trying to, to pursue a career in that. Or if you have a particular way of making expressive images, uh, expressive uh, portraits, then you could attempt to do it. I don't think it's a huge, a huge market. If you're willing to do it at a very low, low end, it could be something that you can produce a lot of. Um, and a question from Linda. Um, she's first, she says, thanks for a great presentation. Um, any quick tips on how to approach commercial galleries? Oh, don't. Oh, <laughs> terrible, terrible, I know. But they're, you know, they're businesses and they are in there every day uh, trying to sell the artists that they, that they, that they work for. Um, and it's not going to help you to kind of go in and take up their time. If they don't accept submissions, don't bother because they're not going to see it. Your best way to get the attention of a commercial gallery really is, and it sounds a bit cynical, but is to sell lots of work and they will come to you. And if you if you are able to do, I would say it again, exhibitions in your studio, in your basement, in your garage, in your kitchen, in your garden shed, and I'm not joking, any space that you can do an exhibition and sell your work, try and sell as much as you can, start your prices low, build as you go. Uh, you, every work that you sell should be slightly more per square inch than the last sale that you made. Then if you are selling work consistently and you do have uh, an audience, a gallery will want to sell your work because they know they can make money from it. It's the business. It might be a bit cynical, but that's what it is. <laughs> so don't. Well there, well, there is a related question. Um, 
some good ways of getting gallery owners interested in the studio visit, cold calling or emailing um, with images or going to a gallery with a portfolio was no longer welcomed. And yes, I will agree with that. Um, I guess, how would you think would be the best way just to get gallery owners interested? It's to sell work. Yeah. To, to, to do whatever you can, all these various things, I mean, to be professional about it and to sell as much as you possibly can and let people know that you're selling through your Instagram and your Facebook, your newsletters, so that the word is out there that you do sell work. And if you are friends with uh, uh, artists who are in the gallery that you would like to be in, and you think it's a good fit, let that artist know that you're, you're selling lots of work, keep them prize of all the sales that happen. And at some point, if you suggest to them that you would like to be in the gallery that they're in, then you could ask them to introduce you to that gallery. And that is a kind of introduction that would be welcomed by that gallery. You going in or sending them an email will probably not, not help you as much as a referral. Um, but the key thing again is that you have to be selling work. Unless you're a critically engaged artist, uh, in which case if you're doing something that's getting written about, you're getting reviews and people are writing critical, art, uh, critical articles about you, then you could sort of rise up into the sphere where you are the type of artist that they would want to have in their gallery, even though your work may not be selling, but it's, uh, it's the kind of criticality that they would want to, to have, uh, in which case you have to be finding another way to generate the resources that you, you need to. And that would happen because you're doing your own exhibitions. Again, I'm going to beat that dead horse. <laughs> do your own shows somewhere and do studio visits. Mm -hmm. um, another question from Clive. Uh, my Instagram feed is full of friends and other artists. How can I get more affluent people to follow me on Instagram? And how do I find those customer with uh, bigger gardens and fatter wallets? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, it's a super deep dive into how you target on Instagram, but it can be done you know, using uh, hashtags for one, using them really effectively. So if you, uh, th th that's kind of a super open question, I'm not exactly sure what you're thinking of, but if you do know of galleries who have work that's like yours in some way, then take a look at their feed and see who engages with their uh, with their profile or their feed, who's liking and commenting on their images. If your work uh, is definable in a good hashtag, then search for that hashtag and see who else follows it. And keep, keep super active in terms of liking and commenting on other, other feeds that relate to what it is that you're doing. I'm really curious what this person does, that they need a garden to show their work. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is if you could share some charity auctions that give good exposure. The biggest one is uh, Splash in Vancouver. It's, uh, I do understand from uh, people who have been involved in it that it is, it, it gets, uh, I think, some of the highest prices other than maybe the VAG. Uh, does as well. I think they, some things they go for quite high prices, but they attract people who are willing to pay, uh, to people who are willing to pay like higher amounts of money if you could get into, into that. I don't know what the relationship is in terms of if they do a split or not, um, but I believe that is the, the biggest one. If you're at the beginning of your career, it's really good. Uh, I'm kind of biased because I'm such a super fan of Access Gallery in Vancouver. And I think their, their uh, auction has been really good for, for getting uh, exposure to people for uh, buyers at a certain level. It is all very modest and it's very small. Um, I would say anywhere that you could, anywhere that you could start to get it in front of, uh, in front of people who are, who's local to you and where there's a good connection to your work. And it may not be something that you do forever. You maybe do it for a few years and then you feel like you've reached enough uh, that you can, you have some contacts through it, you have a bit of networking, you have a bit more exposure, then you can kind of just cut it off and stop, stop doing it. Um, a lot of the other questions I think are quite specific. So I'll go to one that I think might cover it is, do you consult with artists? 
yes, I do uh, in different sorts of ways. Uh, sometimes it's on projects, helping people find ways to realize projects. Uh, other times with people, it's to sort of um, get over a stumbling block. They've kind of reached a, a period in their practice where they feel stagnant or it's a challenge that they can't get over. Um, so I'll go spend an hour kind of asking them to, and it often comes down really to those early questions in the who, what, when, where, why, was the why, why are you doing this? And it's a, it's a bit like coaching. It seems to be a bit sort of helping people with internal reflection. I mean, I do look at a lot of, a lot of art and I have done so for a long time. So sometimes I think my questions can kind of seem like a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a broadside approach to things, but people seem to find it useful. Great. Um, I think that was it mostly for the questions. So I think you kind of covered a lot already. Um, people have been mentioning things like Carfax for open calls. Um, the Reach Gallery apparently currently has one out. Um, the Artist Journal, which is something you could subscribe to for painting and drawing. Um, again, we will uh, gather all these resources and I'll email that out to everybody who's interested in, you know, all the things that has been mentioned throughout the webinar. Um, but otherwise, I think that's we're good for questions now. And thank you so much, Jeffrey. A lot of people have commented on how great detailed presentation it was. So thank you very much. Oh, great. Follow me on Instagram and I'll follow you back. <laughs> I'll see you there. That's a great tip. <laughs> So um, for everyone who is here today, thank you so much for coming. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is the last session for this year of the Art at Work series, but we are continuing um, through the Richmond Art Gallery, the Artist Salon, which is very similar. We host artist talks, um, artist professionals, really to provide some professional development tips. So uh, that's on every, the last Tuesday of each month. And did you have something you wanted to promote as well, <laughs> Jeffrey? I forgot to mention two books that I think are very good for artists. One is Jerry Salt's new book, How to Be an Artist. And the really interesting, th interesting thing about this book, I think is a lot of the material in it came from uh, information and comments that he solicited through Instagram, his very good Instagram account. So a lot of what you find in here is the accumulative knowledge of a very, very, very large community who are interested in what he has to say. So it is, it is good in that way. It's very light reading. The other one, if you want to understand a bit more about the art world, is Grayson Perry's um, Playing to the Gallery. Uh, he's a super funny, witty, uh, middle brow um, potter who won the Turner Prize years ago. It's a really good read to kind of understand the art world. That and they it. both have awesome Instagram accounts as well. So if you follow them on Instagram, Ex you'll yes. get a lot of good reads. Yes. <laughs> And engage with Jerry Saltz like everyone else does. Sometimes he likes or he comments on, on your work if you're an artist or comments on your comments if you're an artist. Yep. Okay. Well, thank, again, thank you very much, Jeffrey. And thank you, everyone, for coming out and, and watching us from your home today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we hope that you join us again sometime. Just, uh, again, if you wanted to review this, uh, it will be on the Richmond Art Gallery website soon. And I will be emailing you all with all the links and the book titles and everything else that Jeffrey's mentioned today. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Bye. having me. Bye.